Thank you. Does this work? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mika. I am the representative of the WordPress plugin review team. I spend my day, when I'm not uh, working for DreamHost writing code there, downloading plugins, verifying that they work well, that they're secure, and uploading them to the WordPress directory so that everyone can use them and download them on their websites. How many of you have written a plugin already? Don't lie, John. I'm kidding. My boss is back there. <laughs> okay. I wasn't sure if I was going to be getting people who had never written plugins or people who had written some and wanted to learn how to do it better. And it looks like I have a bit of a mix going on here. So how many of you have looked at the code of Hello Dolly? OK, not, a, not that many. This will be a little bit boring for you at the beginning, but I promise we'll come back around. I don't have slides because there's no way to teach code by looking at slides. I've never been able to learn by looking at slides. I've never been able to do any of this. But looking at code and writing code, learning by doing and seeing the connections that code makes, that's a different sort of way to learn. So I apologize for the screen here, but it's what I've got. I'm doing exactly what I hate people do, by the way, and uh, live downloading code and demonstrating things. This is a plugin page, <laughs> as everybody knows that. It has a plugin header image. It's got, I burnt my finger making macarons, and so my trackpad doesn't work on that finger anymore, but I'm still trying to use it. <laughs> All right, it's got a little icon over there. It says, Hello Dolly by Matt Mullenweg has a description it tells you everything about the plugin. Every single plugin page basically works the same way. Every single plugin essentially works the exact same way. You've written something that connects to other parts of WordPress to display something. All plugins must do something. And that sounds very broad and very vague because it is. Sometimes the thing is, let's see, did Matt put in? He did not put in screenshots, darn it. Hopefully you've seen Hello Dolly, and you know that what it does is it puts uh, the lyrics of Hello Dolly on your WordPress site on the administration end. So you can, as you're working and writing your next great post, it tells you things, you know, Hello Dolly, the gang's all here. If you've seen the musical Hello Dolly, and if you haven't, I recommend you do, it's really funny. It's, it's hilarious, and it's a great song, too. But the code for Hello Dolly is included in every single install of WordPress. And the reason for this is it's to explain to people how simple it can be to write a plugin. Simple is a word that I don't like to use. What's simple to me is not simple to you. What's obvious to me is not obvious to you. It can't be. But at the risk of, of using this word that I hate, this is the most simplistic code that you can write with WordPress to have it interact and do something different on page loads. As we're going to start at the bottom, or rather in the middle. <laughs> it's kind of the bottom. If you want to know something funny, if he submitted this plugin today, I'd send him an email back and say that you've named your functions inconsistently. He has Hello Dolly and then Dolly CSS. And I'd say, you should have this be Hello Dolly CSS. And that should be Hello Dolly. When you're writing code, I strongly encourage you to name things consistently. It'll help you with debugging. It'll help you remember this is the CSS for Hello Dolly. Also, all of your functions always should reference the plugin that you are. You can use, if you're familiar with using classes or namespaces, definitely please use them. But if you're writing something this, this small, it's OK to just use functions. But when you do, make sure the functions are named in a way that won't cause a conflict. 
This might. <laughs> we'll let it go because it's one of the first plugins, though. OK. The majority of what this plugin does is it lists all those lyrics that we have up at the top on a page. Just shows one line every time you load a page on the admin area. The way that it does this is it does this function here. It adds an action to, hel to admin notices. It says, run Hello Dolly. Hello Dolly is this function up here, which says, run get uh, use chosen. We're going to get the lyric, and we're going to echo it here. This just makes it look pretty. The brunt of the code is really just these two sections. The majority of what a plugin does is it's an action to do a thing. And the action does a thing by calling another function to get information. At its heart, that's what all plugins are doing. We have an action to do a thing, and often, really, really, today of all days, you had to do that. It's OK. No, it's fine. It just turned itself, it locked itself. And I thought I had it set to not do that. All right. It's supposed to be smart enough to know when it's plugged in like this to not turn itself off. It seems to not be doing that today. All right, all plug chains. Action to do a thing, function to determine what gets output. This is the definition of all plugins. Now, when we look back at the lyrics section, first off, this is just all the text that's going to be in the lyrics. And the two really weird bits of code are down here. And I'm going to scroll that up so that you guys can see that a little better. All right. We defined all of those lines of code as a variable called lyrics. Now, each of them have line breaks. So here, Matt says, we're going to explode lyrics, separate it by each line break. And then randomly, we're going to pick one. And that's what we're returning. So down here, when we say chosen is hello dolly get lyric, it calls this, which kicks out one line. And then it produces this code, which will be one of the lines. And it'll be displayed on the admin side of your site. This is the heart of everything. If you can figure out how this works, if you can understand the process that it goes through, you can write a plugin to do anything. And plugins do do anything. Uh, there's a beekeeping plugin. There's a beer brewing plugin. I like that one. Uh, I think of a subject, and I bet there's a plugin for it. Plugins are amazing, but they're also very complicated. Now. Would you guys be interested in together coming up with an idea of a plugin and together writing a simple plugin? Does that sound kind of cool? OK. What kind of, uh, somebody throw out an idea for a plugin. Keep the idea as small as possible, though, because we're not going to write. Having written a plugin that talks to uh, the Amazon Echo, we're not doing that again. <laughs> That's really hard. John? How complicated is creating a temporary admin user? Uh, moderately complicated because of the security issues involved. Uh, we could write our own version of Hello Dolly. I mean, OK, you want to know something funny? This is the most popular plugin to fork. The, the, if you go through the directory and look at all the plugins, there are many Hello Dolly. There's uh, Hello Dolly Llama. There's uh, Hello Dalek if you like Doctor Who. Uh, there's, uh, there's one that just lists the sports teams. The, it, it's uh, Hello Sports Teams. I don't even know if we still have that anymore. But when people want to learn how to do a plugin, this is often something that they like to do, is that they, is they get the idea of, OK, first I'll just replace the text. Well, next I want to make it look different. I want to change the colors. Well, next I only want it to load on some screens. That's also kind of fun. So let's see. Let's think. If we don't, if you guys don't have an idea for a plugin, let's. We're going to start with forking Hello Dolly and doing some of those things, so you can see the practical application. Let's see that I do have. Oh, yeah. Let's do that one. 
Hopefully I have local by flywheel actually set up with a test environment. It crashed on, not right now. <laughs> it crashed on me the other day and I had to rebuild. So hopefully I do still have this. Uh, and if not, I will really quickly. I'm going to open Hello Dolly first. Yeah, I was just looking at the zip file. I, I use a tool called bbedit, which lets me uh, open zip files and read everything that's in them without having to unzip them first. Because I review plugins, this saves me hours of time a week. Hello Dolly, though, is, it's only two files. I mean, it's Hello PHP and README PHP. Oh, good. Yes, fix that. I do have a plug I have a plugin site. So I, I test plugins a lot, so I tend to do that. All right. Let's go. That'll work. Please work. Yay. All right. We have a plugin testing site. This is good. WP Awesome, yes, because that's exactly how you log into WordPress. <laughs> Whenever you're typing live and doing a class like this, there's always this great nervous thing of, I have to remember how to type in front of a group of 30 or 40 people, and then you forget how to type. So, uh -oh. That's fun. You get to see, embarrassingly, I don't remember the password for this site. I thought it was admin password. No, not for, not for this. I set it up uh, somewhat differently. Let's see. <laughs> you can show me how to crack it. <laughs> that would work, too. But uh, if you've ever, have you guys ever seen WPCLI? OK. So WPCLI is a command line interface for WordPress, so that if you you know, for example, in this case, if I lock myself out, I can go in and reset my password. But let's see. Oh, okay. So it is admin. So the password, it should be admin password then. Oh, that would be bad of me, huh? <laughs> it is admin password. I just couldn't type. Like I said, you get nervous when you're typing in front of a lot of So it's hot in here. Gosh. All right. Let's activate Hello Dolly so we can look at it for a second. Now that's pretty cool, but that's kind of small, isn't it? I mean, that, that, I don't know. I like, obviously, I like my text a little bit larger. I'm aware that this is out of date. I'm not going to update it right now because I don't want to kill the Wi-Fi. What if we made that larger? How hard could that be to make it larger? All right, we saw the CSS already. Uh, if you're actually writing code, please don't use the WordPress editor the way I'm about to use it. Uh, I pers in fact, you know what, I'm going to show, I'm going to do this the right way. Uh, I have a tool that I like to use called Coda. Theoretically, it's remembering that I just pressed the button. It's opening. Coda is a code editor that is specifically designed to let you look at, well, code, basically. Let's see. Do I have plugin dev? I do. Yay. Oh, go me. WP content, plugins, hello. Excellent. So this is the exact same code, but you'll notice now it's kind of color coded in a different way. And because I'm using Coda, if I wanted to change WordPress code, like if I wanted to start typing in a function name, uh, let's see, WP, I start seeing all the WordPress functions. So if you're developing uh, software and, like me, you can never remember what all the function names are because it's WP footer but WP head, and I don't know why, uh, you, can, you can cheat and use these autocompletes. Uh, Coda has this stuff. It's free. Coda is, sadly, a somewhat expensive software. It, I think it's uh, 75 or a couple hundred dollars now. Uh, I couldn't live without it. <laughs> Atom, however, A-T-O-M, is free, and a lot of people really like that. I have trouble looking at dark colors and not being able to change the font size and the colors of things the way I, I needed to meant that Coda worked better for me. Fin hmm? 
Yeah, I couldn't make the color look right, and I was spending so much time changing it that it made me mad. And there are a lot of UI things. Right. So, okay, okay. I, no, I'm trying to explain this uh, uh, without going into a really long history of what I used to do. I used to have to rebuild my desktop every other week. It was a requirement for the job that I had. And in doing so, I got in the habit of if the defaults that come with a thing aren't to my liking and I have to spend more than five minutes changing things, it's not the tool for me. It wasn't made for me, although I could make it work for me. Uh, so it, and it's very much a personal preference. So I strongly recommend Adam for everyone else to look at it, at least to get the idea of how you want to do these because it also has the PHP complete. Uh, it knows PHP functions. It'll know you can do add-ons to know WordPress functions. And that way, you don't have to memorize every single function in the database, because nobody except maybe Nason can do that. He used to work for, uh, Andrew Nason is one of the lead developers of WordPress. He used to work for Walmart. And he, for some reason, memorized all the, uh, the identification numbers for all the items, so he could know where everything was. He's sort of a genius. I'm not that kind of genius. So when we look at Hello Dolly, that's the CSS code. And right here, he's got the font size is 11. I have bad eyes. I don't know that you could, you know, these are a giveaway. I want to make that larger, so I'm going to make that 16. No, I'm editing the file directly. If I was really writing code, I would be editing this in a Git or SVN repository, testing it locally, and then pushing it live. For the sake of example, let's pretend I'm doing that. It takes a long time to set all that up. Once I've done that, though, I refresh. And now it's, not only is it larger, uh-oh, it's moved to another side because I made it bigger. But also because uh, I've got this warning, and they're both using the same thing called admin notices. So admin notices, these are, these are your admin notices. You see them whenever you have anything that needs to update. And that's great, but it means that the formatting is going to look weird depending on how long the line is. See how it jumped down here? Maybe this isn't the best code and the best CSS layout. We could spend a lot of time fiddling with the CSS layout. We could make it look exactly like that. We could have it be with a little yellow bar on the side and everything if we wanted to. All we have to do is just keep editing these things. Float left, float right. Now what Matt does here is he checks uh, what your language preference is. So we've got is RTL. Now this is a, this is an if statement. It doesn't look like one. You th you, most of us think of an if statement as, we'll look at it like this. If is RTL, and we say then, uh, we would do, let's see, x equals left. Oh, here, I'll format that nicely there. Else, x equals right. I know I'm missing the ending there. <laughs> These are the same thing. This one's smaller. And it's actually almost easier to read because you're seeing is, question mark, yes, no. That's all that this is. So this is the, yeah, this is the if, else going on right there in one line. When you've got small amounts of data, I strongly recommend you do this. Uh, it took me forever to realize how powerful that was. But if you were also doing things, like if you wanted to accept parameters in this, you could then sanitize it right then and there. You could check if things, if it was a valid email, for example. If it's a valid email, copy the email. Otherwise, say no email. You can do all that with these uh, tenery operations. And they'll make your life a lot easier because I mean, this is what? One, two, three, four, five lines versus one. It, it's partially a stylistic choice, but also if you wanted to do multiple different ones, like if I wanted to say, if it's RTL, change the color to red. I personally don't recommend, by the way, using uh, variable names like X or Y. I like my variable names to be something that I as a human can remember. Oh, right, I'm talking about color here. So let's see. If it's right to left, I want it to be red. Otherwise, I want it to be blue. 
And now I'm going to say, let's see, color is equal to color. And now it's blue. And we've done that just by adding in this line here to say, if it's right to left, if it's left to right. So now here we're just, again, we're just taking the parameter that we've set, and we're calling it down here in our echo. We're echoing it in admin head. Yes, it's admin head and admin footer, by the way. Yes, it's, it feels like it should be admin header and admin footer. I don't know why. A lot of things with WordPress were written, and then we got stuck with them, and we couldn't change them down the line because it takes so long to get everybody to update your code. If tomorrow we changed this and said, OK, it's not going to be admin header, we'd have to deprecate it because otherwise we'd break everybody, including Hello Dolly, that was using it. So we don't really want to do that. We've got all the, <laughs> it's also got spell check, by the way. Did I mention that? <laughs> this is really useful if you can't spell or if you're typing in a language you don't know. I can change this and say that I'm typing in French. Uh, right now, it thinks that I'm typing in uh, Canadian English, though, which means I'm wondering why it doesn't know what favorite is. Canadians like to use use as well as, you know, gray with an E. If we want to change the lyrics that display, we can do that here. One thing we did, I did note is that the shorter they are, the more likely they are to be on the left. So when we go back and look here, <coughs> short ones show up over here and the long ones show up down here. OK, one way I can fix that is I could just do that. OK, I've split it up into two lines. But another thing I could do is I could trim it so that it's short. I could limit the number of characters that we're going to display. Now, go ahead and ask me, what's the function to do that? I don't remember off the top of my head. <laughs> I never do, and I, am, I should. I do it all the time. No, I'm constantly pulling up Google and saying, uh, let's see, truncate right side of variable PHP. And I'm trusting Google to know when I typo. Substr. I should know this by heart. I don't. Never feel bad if you have to Google something, guys. So I promise. Never feel bad. Every single developer that you're ever going to meet, everybody who writes core, they're all going to be Googling every once in a while. And they're all going to be going, mm, what is this again? This is why live coding is terrifying, because people are afraid. I'm going to get up here, and I'm going to talk to people about coding and development, and I don't know everything. I, I'm here up here in front of you Googling something because I couldn't remember it was Substr. should know that by heart, but I don't. Oh, look, I'm also French today. Thanks. <laughs> you can also do R trim, but that only deletes white spaces. If you wanted to trim white space from the end of a line and you're using WordPress, you can just use trim. It kills it from both sides at once, which is great. Oh, hey, look, PHP trim also. It didn't exist in all versions of PHP. That was a fun time. All right. So let's say... We know that we only want to show the first 15 characters for substring. OK, well, here I've got my code where I'm taking the lyrics, the one random lyric, and I'm returning it. In order to make this a little easier for me, I'm going to change this to make a variable called line. And I'm going to return line. Now, the reason that I broke it out is that now I can do line is this is why these autofills are great. String and start. It tells me that the string is the string that I'm wanting to trim. And int is an integer to start where am I doing the trimming? Where am I subtracting? It gives me a hint to remind me, how am I supposed to use this particular function? It is impossible to remember all of them. All right, so my string is line. And my int, let's say, I'm just going to grab a number. I'm going to say 15. And I need to remember <laughs> to add that. If uh, This is the number one error I make. I forget to do a trailing semicolon. And then I'm standing, staring at my code. And what sucks is that PHP is going to tell me that the error is here. It, it, it's going to say unexpected something. And 
I couldn't do a return. And I'll be staring at it going, but the return is fine. Anytime you get a PHP error and you're looking at the line and it makes no sense, go up. All right, so let's see what happens now that we've done that. I'm swaying. Because what we did is we said substring from the right, 15 characters from the right. So I'm swaying becomes swaying. Lee. Uh oh. Now we've introduced a problem. Live debugging. This is fun. All right. Playing. How would that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, so, what it, uh, so what's going on is that we've got one of these. We've got a, an apostrophe sitting out there. And when we truncated, it had the apostrophe. And it's trying to texturize it and doesn't know how to. Because right here, we've got WP texturize. When you have texturize and it's non-contextual, and it just says, well, there's an there's a apostrophe, but what do I do? I could remove that, but I don't want to. So I have a couple of choices. One is that I could do a string replace, and I could say, let's replace all of my apostrophes. The other is I could remove WP texturize. And this is where you start getting into the weird stuff of, I have to decide everything about what my plugin does. Let's see. Oh, substring. There we go. Substring replace. Now you can get fun. You say mixed string. Mixed replacement, mixed start. You can use it to, I know, it, I know it kept this on the end. It's not supposed to, but sometimes it gets confused. We're not going to do that one, though, because that's a little crazy. There we go. Substr. Shush. You can change that to five. And now, this is like, all of debugging is just, that didn't work, let's try something else, and keep trying and trying and trying until you understand the why of the error and the how of the fix. And don't feel bad if it takes you, you know, six hours to realize you forgot the semicolon, or a day and you're showering and all of a sudden you realize, that's the problem. When I worked, for, I used to work for a bank, and we had a weird problem where every time they ran a script, it would delete their development environment. We couldn't figure out why. Well, finally, we sat down. We're like, OK, what is the script doing? And step one of the script was to delete everything in the, t in the uh, not the dev environment, but the test environment, where people were supposed to test what dev was. The problem was somebody had made a symlinked folder. And it was in the test environment that pointed back to the dev environment. Instead of copying everything over, they symlinked it. So when you deleted the symlink with rm-rf, it deleted the everything. It took us a really long time, and that was like one of those shower re revelations where I was trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out because I didn't write the code. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, it does a delete. Wasn't there a folder? All right. So if I change it to five, what that really does is it's just going to move it out because now I get it again. It's so nice to have you back where you, you belong. It's good that it's actually longer because longer lines are a little bit easier to try to figure out. And here's this. So what happens? Oh, this could be this line or this line. It's the same line. There's a term in development that we say called DRY. And we mean don't repeat yourself. This is repeated, and this is repeated. Obviously, when Matt did this, he just dumped the lyrics in. There's nothing wrong with that. If you were writing this and wanting it to be translated, I would strongly recommend you not do it this way. Because all it would do is repeat a line, but it would mean that somebody might translate it multiple times or think that it's contextually different from another time. If you only need it once, and it doesn't matter how many times you call it or how often it's called, you're not going to need anything like that. <laughs> OK. The funny thing is that looking at this, it just occurred to me exactly why we're seeing the numbers. So it's not because there's a slash or not a slash. It's because WP Texturize has changed the apostrophe into ampersand hash 8 whatever. And it's just deleting the ampersand hash 8 whatever right there. So literally, the only way to fix this would be to remove WP Texturize. Well, that kind of sucks. 
but let's see. Uh, there. All right, we've removed WP Texturize. That should make this. Yep. Now they're starting to look a little bit better. It's fun to see it when you've when you've made something shorter, by the way, because these things don't make any sense. Oh, look. Now it no. There's the same line. It's so nice to have you back where you belong, where you had an error. Now the error is gone because it didn't try to texturize it and make it all funky. That's going to be the only way we'll get around it, doing the truncation the way that we are. You guys just got to do live debugging and see somebody have that realization in front of you. And by the way, the face that I made is probably the same one you guys make when you look in the mirror. If you, if you ever manage to look in the mirror right as you realize something, it's the same. Oh, right. We all do this. It's a very universal face. It's kind of fun. OK. So we've changed the size. We've changed the color. That's the heart of writing your own plugin. Now, here's an interesting question. Do you know why WP Texturize was put up there? WP Texturize is what make, hmm? Security? No, not security, with, not with that one. Uh, but that's a, good, that's a good guess. WP Texturize is there so that these uh, straight apostrophes and straight quotes can become the curved ones that people are used to looking at them. It makes it look like text that we're used to reading. This is great for programming. And by the way, whenever you're copy pasting code, please double check <laughs> that you didn't paste in a curly, a curly quote. That is the number one error when people are editing their own WP config files, that they'll copy a line from someone's blog and not realize that WP Texturize has done that, that they've made it a curly quote. And then all of a sudden, it's wrong when you copy and paste it in. By removing WP Texturize, we, we prevent that from happening. When people put code up on their websites, we recommend that they use code tags or a plugin that lets you wrap, uh, wrap your code in a short code because it will remove the texturization so that other people don't have that problem. So WP Texturize is not necessary for security. It's necessary to make it look nice. When we're talking about security, we're talking about functions like escaping and sanitizing. Escaping and san OK. I was just talking about this upstairs to the fellows I was showing how to do plugin reviews to. So plugin security relies on three things, or at least writing plugin. Writing code that is secure reply, relies on three things. Your first thing is you have to sanitize everything because you can't trust anyone, even especially yourself. Future you will love you for sanitizing everything. Secondly, you have to validate everything. And that means that if you have a field where someone's going to enter in a number, you have to make sure it's always a number. Because if they put in a word and that crashes the plugin, that's your fault. You didn't stop them from doing something wrong. You have to validate. But it gets even weirder than that because a date could be a number. I could just be wanting to put in you know, uh, the date that I want something to happen. I say the 31st. OK, that's great. But what happens if it's in February? That doesn't exist. So validation is as much checking contextually that what you're saving matches what it's supposed to be. But it's also making sure it's in the format it should be. We were reviewing upstairs a nutrition plugin. And I looked at it. And the developer was using a thing called strip slashes. Now, what that does is it makes it safe to save, but it doesn't validate anything. And I said, well, wait a second. If I was using this plugin and I was putting in the nutritional information, what if I wanted to put in imperial and metric? What if I wanted both of those in there because I was making it for Canada, where people are kind of used to both? How do I do that? If it strip slashes, it would take away a slash that I put in. All of a sudden, my data would look wrong, and the developer hadn't considered it. There's nothing inherently bad with not considering it, but you have to start broadening your mind to the global use of your code. You don't know how people will use it, so you have to restrict their use to what you know will work. I caught you this time. <laughs> the, other, the last part of sanitization, the trifecta, is escaping. So we sanitize what we save, we validate what we save, and we escape what we display. 
Has anyone ever gone to a web page and had JavaScript things pop up right away and it looks like a bug? We call those cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because what it is is people can enter JavaScript into a form and then run code that affects the website, not necessarily the user. And if they're poorly written enough, then they can be used to hack into a site. When we sanitize and when we escape, we prevent things from happening. There's a, there's a comic strip called XKCD. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. If you, if you are, there's, a, there's a, a joke about little bobby tables. And what it is is a, is a woman has named her son Robert Drop Tables semicolon. And they go to enter it into the school database, and it wipes out the school records. And the school calls and says, how dare you do that? And she says, oh, yes, my darling son, little Bobby Drop Tables. That's sort of a great example of why sanitization is a huge problem. If you're not sanitizing the input when someone gives you data and you save it, you run the risk of losing all your tables. And while it's funny to read, you know, oh, ho, ho, she broke the school, when you suddenly start realizing that could happen on my website, you realize why we care so much about you doing the sanitization and about you escaping. Because on the flip side, when you output that back out, she could have had, you know, little Juliet XSS vulnerability as her other child. And when somebody goes to look at the list of students on the page, it could hack their browser. Because yes, that can happen. We escape what we display. Now, WordPress, thankfully, has a bunch of functions. It's got, oh my gosh, probably 20 or 30 specific sanitization functions just for WordPress, just for doing the things that people commonly do. We have text area. We have text fields. So if you only have a line, we can do that. You can save things as HTML. We have WPKSES. I apologize greatly for that name. Uh, it, it's one of those things that, that we made as a backronym, which means it didn't really have an acronym, but then we pretended it did going back. Like PHP isn't an acronym, but we pretend it's, it was made up later. This is what happens when you let American programmers do weird things. They just do weird things. But we have all these sanitization functions. Um, there should be this. Oops. I can type, I swear. Now that's not actually going to work because I have to do it this way. Uh, and that's because I'm putting PHP code in the middle of an echo. I have to stop it. So that's what happens with the, uh, with the quote here. I have to do the period to say, and continue including what's next. That's escape HTML chosen. Period. We're going to continue with what's next. And I've got my more HTML. Does this still work? Works fine. Now we're escaping the output. And to be honest, this is what you should do. Even though it's not accepting any special inputted data, it's just a good habit to get into. Escape what you display, sanitize and validate what you save. I have like five minutes left before questions. Oh gosh. OK, let's see. We did a little bit of security. We showed how we edit plugins. Showed that clearly I haven't updated my dev environment recently. <laughs> we released 4.8. I was busy making sure 4.8 worked before I took care of my own test sites. Which, I mean, this is a local install, by the way. Um, OK, you know what? let's do that really briefly. I mentioned uh, Coda, which is what I use. And I mentioned that there's uh, Atom as editors that you can use. When you want to test WordPress locally, there are tools that you can and should be using for that. Because imagine if I was doing this on my live website and I had somebody else using that website, like my mom or dad, have a, we have a family blog where they all go in and P2 and leave each other little messages. If I was making changes like that live, I would probably have a bunch of angry texts from my father right now going, why is the color changing? What are you doing? And that's not really nice. And, and what is nice, though, is testing everything locally and then emailing everyone saying, hey, we're making a change. Don't panic. The colors can change to blue. People like to know things. And when you're running a site for other people, it's really important to communicate the changes you make before you make them. But that means it's really important to test your changes locally before you push them live. I'm using an app called Local. It's by a company called Flywheel. And it lets me have a local development environment that I can use WPCLI to go into and be a, you know, a big, fancy developer. 
but it also lets me build sites relatively quickly. Uh, you can see I've got DreamHub. Oh, hey, look, I'm going to crash my company website. <laughs> no, that's actually that's I actually just use that for debugging customers. When customers have big problems, I just slap a, a, copies of the code on my DreamHub site so that I can play with it and not impact them directly. Uh, the other two is me doing weird stuff that I like to do. And this is for testing plugins. If you want to make a new one, I mean, it's really, you press the plus button and you walk through and you tell it, I'd like this version of PHP, or WordPress, this version of PHP, this web server, I could change it to Nginx. You can make it mimic your environment. Not exactly, but very close. Local by Flywheel and desktop server by ServerPress and MAMP are the three easiest local environments to get used to. Desktop server has an advantage because it lets you push from your local site to your server. So if you wanted to develop everything locally and then say, okay, it's done, it's ready, I want to push all my files up to my, my server, it's good, and press a button, you can do it. It does cost money for that version. The free one just lets you edit locally. That said, I am a proponent of using code versioning systems. I have my own Git repository that I use to make all of my changes so that I can track them and so that when I go back and, and make a change, uh, for example, those, those two sites, LesPress and LesWatch, are sites that I work on with Tracy Levesque. She's also here working on the design team. If I make a change and Tracy really hates it, she can go and see exactly what I changed and I've always left a comment as to, you know, this was changed to fix this problem or this was changed because I hated the color. And she can see what I did and why and either revert it because it's causing another problem, or we can discuss, OK, look, don't change colors without talking to each other first, which is really what you should be doing with your other developers. Code changing via a system like that is great. I go back and I say, code is awesome because it can update SVN and Git directly from Coda. I don't have to go in and do things via command line if I don't want to. If you're hosting WordPress plugins, the most important thing to know is that we use SVN. No, you can't use Git yet. Yes, we're aware that everybody wants to use Git. WordPress existed before Git did. Literally, we're older. And so many things are tied into SVN that unraveling it, while it is possible and it is going to happen one day, it's not going to happen tomorrow. So. We understand your frustration, but please be patient. Uh, if it was just a matter of, oh, we'll just switch everything over, we'd be done. It's a matter of uninstalling a lot of specific hooks that we have going on. And we're making some decisions going forward about ways to allow you to push, for example, from GitHub directly to the WordPress repository. We're working on it. We literally started the code last night. So it's not done. It, it, depending on how many beers you buy auto, uh, he's about this tall, scraggly guy with a hat and a beard. I know, that just described like so many people. <laughs> if, you, if you meet Otto and you buy him a beer and you ask him, you know, can I help you with this, he'll, he'll start making you work, so just watch out. But uh, he's working on that because he likes the idea, which is great. But we do use SVN, and yes, that means you do have to learn how to use it. Now, good news. You only have to use it to release your code. You don't have to use it to develop your code. If you want to develop on GitHub, do it. All you have to do is copy the code over and do SVN up. And I'm like seconds away from being done, so we'll call that there. Okay. No, we're good. All right, because I know you guys are going to have questions. So thank you. How does someone go from a basic WordPress developer, uh, from a basic PHP developer to a WordPress developer in six months? Um, the best thing I can say is get really, really mad at something that WordPress is doing and want to change it. The, I went from a very basic C plus developer, an ASP developer. I was working for a bank. We did weird things in, in Perl and stuff like that to a WordPress developer because Literally, I wanted to be able to have hidden text that you could only see when you uh, highlight it with your mouse. And WordPress at the time didn't have a, a plugin that did it. 
So I sat down and I taught myself how to write it because I really wanted it. The best way to be a WordPress developer is to find something you want because that passion will lead you to writing the code. Now, the fastest way to learn the WordPress code, besides just to write it, is to start downloading other people's plugins that are vaguely similar to what you're interested in and reading it. And I, that sounds very strange, but just looking at Hello Dolly and reading it and understanding it and seeing how your changes impact what it does, that's how you do learn. That's how we all learned. If you go back to, to kindergarten and elementary school, we all learned by doing these things and making mistakes and let's make our little man out of clay. Oh, wait, that didn't work. He fell apart. We learn by doing. And we forget that as we grow older because we think, well, we can only learn by going to a class and we can only learn by listening to very smart people tell me what to do. But the truth is we all know how to learn. We just got confused a little bit because school tells us, no, you have to learn from the book. But we learn, we all learn. We learn to walk by somebody holding our hands and then letting go. We learn to ride our bicycle by our dads just shoving us down the hill and saying, good luck. <laughs> that might have just been me. <laughs> but WordPress, WordPress being open source and letting anyone see the code means that we really want you to learn by doing this, by taking Hello Dolly and maybe making it so that it changes what echoes based on who's logged in. That I see Hello Dolly and my dad sees uh, lyrics from Bob Dylan, his favorite musician. And my mother sees lyrics from James Taylor, her favorite musician. And then you can do little changes like that to understand how it all comes together and to make the change that you want. Does that help? Okay, cool. Yeah? Yes. Are there any conventions for you know um, where files should go, subdirectories, what you know what files should be named? Okay. Can you repeat the question yeah. for the recording? Please? Yes. Did I not for the first one? We don't hear. Oh, okay. I thought I did. Um, okay. I'm asking you to repeat the, our question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the question is, are there standards for naming files and the design of the files and the file names within the plugins? There's only one file name that's required, and it's readme.txt. That's it. Everything else, you can name the files inside your plugin anything you want. You can name it the main file index.php and have like this is hello.php and all the code is in it. That's fine. For a complex plugin, I was just talking about this upstairs. For a complex plugin, do what makes sense for you. For example, if you feel it's easier to have all of the, uh, the page output on one, on one separate file and all of the code that handles the input and the sanitization in another file, that's fine. It's what makes you comfortable and you can continue to support as a developer. I personally recommend keeping it in one file if it's small like this. But I like to have them in separate files the minute I'm starting to have multiple admin screens. So uh, I've written some fairly large plugins. I can actually really quickly show you one because they're all on here. Hey. Uh, let's see. WordPress Git. Yes, I name things, uh, fun things. OK. So this plugin is called Banhammer. And what it does is it blocks people from logging into your site. So you can say, anybody with this email address can't log into my site, or anyone from gmail.com can't, can't make an account on my site. And Banhammer has these files, has the main file and an uninstall file, and that's it. Even though it's a very complex plugin, it used to have six files, and I made it less complex as time went on because I learned how to code better. Don't worry, by the way, if your first plugin is really, really overly complicated, it's OK. You'll learn as you go on. But what I did was I used classes to keep it all in one thing. The reason it had multiple files was that I was, couldn't figure out how to make it work with BuddyPress. So in the beginning, the first thing it would check is, are you running BuddyPress? Call this completely other file instead. And as I got smarter, and as BuddyPress got smarter, I was able to fold all of that back into each other. It's common. You'll see up there it says Banhammer is the folder name and Banhammer.php is the file name. It's common to do that, but it's not required. What's important about the file 
is this. This is your plugin header. Now, what we require is your plugin name, your plugin description, and your plugin version. Those are the only three things you have to have. The rest, you know, I have this so I, you can see more information about the plugin. I have this so you can know who I am if you need to get in touch with me for some reason. Probably, I hope not. This is because it's a multi-site thing and I say you can only activate it network on a multi-site. And the text domain I don't even need anymore because the Polyglots team uh, is just amazingly brilliant and they now, it just grabs the folder name. It says your text domain is by default the folder name Banhammer. I don't have to fill that in. That's left over from when I did have to fill those things in. And a super complicated one is this guy. <laughs> This is Dream Objects backups. It makes backups of your, of your website and copies it up to Dream Objects cloud storage. It's a lot of files. You, when you go into this one, it's got even more. I broke this apart because it was the only way I could keep track of everything that I was doing. I have vendors. I've got libraries. Oh, look, I've got even more. I've got WPCLI commands that it's running. It, it really is, it depends on how complicated the plugin is. It doesn't matter what you name the files, but don't ever, ever change that file name once you've decided what it is. If you do, it'll deactivate the plugin on upgrade. Yeah. Uh, if you ever look inside WordPress, there's, a, there's an option called Active Plugins in the WP Options table, and it saves your plugin that's active as plugin folder slash file name. Well, if you change the file name, it doesn't always pick up that that's the same plugin, so it deactivates it. Sometimes it gets it right, but it's sort of been iffy lately, and I'm not sure why. And yes, there's a bug ticket for it. Is there anything else? You guys, oh, yeah. Uh, for instance, there is a one plugin existing, and there's one function that's bothering you, and you want to write it your own way. Yes. How would you suggest to override it in your, in your plugin so that it uses that plugin? What, uh, what would you guide for that? Okay, so if there's a plugin, the yeah, I got it. <laughs> if, if, there's a, if there's a plugin that has a function that you want to override, what's the best way to do that? It depends on the plugin. Some plugins are well written that will allow you to filter what the output is. But in certain cases, what you'll have to do is write your own plugin that looks for that function or that action that does whatever it is it does, removes the action because there is a func there's a, a a way you can delete an action. So you've got add action, you can use delete action. Delete their action and add your own. The third way, and this is the way that most people do it, is they create a fork of the plugin, which is they copy the plugin, they rename the functions to something else, and then they fix it in that. It depends on what the change is that you're making. If you're making a change to text that is output, hopefully they have a filter. And if not, I would contact the developer and say, I really love this plugin, but I need to make this one change. Can you make that something filterable? Uh, look up filters. They kind of break my brain because it's just, I'm going to wrap filter uh, a check that says if it's filtered around my output, and then somebody else can just filter it. And I don't get that it just works, but it does. Sometimes code doesn't make sense to me, but I use it anyway. Did you have a follow-up or? OK. Saw you moving your hand. It was just your glasses. I try to pay attention. Did that help, though? OK. Yes? Uh, is there something like a child theme? Or if, if we're using, uh, we're developing things, we have child themes to secure our modifications for updates. <coughs> is there such a thing for plugins? So if we, if we add our functions where there are no filters and actions mm -hmm. available. So the question is, uh, much like we have child themes where we can safely edit certain components of a theme safely and not have to worry about upgrades deleting them, do we have a commensurate uh, relationship with plugins? We don't. That's why I mentioned filters and delete action, uh, remove action and add action. There is no such concept as a child plugin. Uh, we were at the WordPress Community Summit. We were discussing this exact problem, by the way, because it's a problem. Because if I have a plugin that requires WooCommerce, I should be able to always easily say, my plugin needs WooCommerce. If WooCommerce isn't around, my plugin should stop working. But on top of that, I should get a warning on my site. If you, if you have a child theme and you try to delete the parent theme from your site, WordPress won't let you because you'll break your site. 
It says, you can't do this, you're using a child theme, stop. Obviously, you can go in via FTP and just delete it anyway, but WordPress, when it can stop you from shooting yourself in the foot, it'll do it. We don't do that with plugins, and we need to. And it's a cause that I champion greatly because I feel that it makes things very difficult for plugin developers to continually make changes to plugins, to make uh, add-ons to other plugins without having this ability. There's a track ticket where we're arguing for it. Uh, more voices and people saying this would really be useful. Uh, if, you go, if you ever go into WordPress track and you see an idea that you really, really like, and you're not sure how to tell people, I like this idea, at the bottom of the page, there's a little uh, place where you can press a button to star it. We use that to determine if people like the idea or if people are interested in what's going on. And the more people who are interested, the more attention we know we need to pay to make this fixed or changed in some way. It'll also start emailing you every time someone updates the ticket, though, so please watch out. Some of those tickets can get pretty uh, heavily trafficked. But it's a great way to add your vote without making it too noisy and detracting from the people who are arguing the technical aspects of the problem. Okay, so well, that's enough time for one more question. Going once. Yeah. Yes, you, totally. What number is an average number of plugins that does not affect the performance, for example? What number is the average number of <coughs> plugins that doesn't affect the performance of your site? On an average. Just there isn't one. Uh, so uh, there was a show in the United States called Name That Tune. And people would say, I can name that tune in in a one word or one note. I can, I can name that tune in zero notes. I can crash a WordPress website and make it really, really slow with one plugin. I could do it with any plugin. Pick a pl I could do it with Hello Dolly. The number of plugins that you use does not directly impact the speed of your site. It's the quality of the plugins that you choose to use and the way those plugins interact with each other. 10 people can use, let's say everybody installs and activates Hello Dolly, and one person has a slow site. It might be because of their server. It might be because of PHP. It might be because of their theme has something in there where somebody says, I really hate Hello Dolly. So if someone has that active, I'll make it slow. I s uh, I'm uh, repeatedly seeing uh, hosting companies adding some crazy plugins that uh, give a bad experience like object caching plugins are uh, added uh, dropped in by mm -hmm. GoDaddy and imagine you're running an e-commerce site okay. and uh, you're trying to add a product to the cart it just does they're caching something caching the checkout page okay like uh, what how do you think uh, uh, why do you think uh, hosting companies are doing this you know adding their own plugins but so, not sure you know? uh, the question is why are hosting companies adding in their own plugins or plugins that they feel that you should be using uh, even though they can sometimes poorly impact people's sites. So this is a very interesting question because of what my day job is. I work for DreamPress, which is the managed hosting product of DreamHost, and we add in object caching to everyone's site. The reason that we do this is that for managed hosting solutions, we built your server to be cacheable like that, to use object caching. And I know that GoDaddy does this too. They've actually tested with WooCommerce, and out of the box, a plain vanilla WooCommerce site doesn't have these problems. However, like the previous question, what's the number of plugins to make your site run poorly? It really ends up being one. It's just one bad plugin. What's most likely happening in that situation is you have one plugin that is conflicting with object cache. The way in which it's saving data is a less than optimal WordPress way. Object caching, object caching is generally used to save the queries that are being made to the database. So if somebody is coming to your site and they're doing the same requests over and over again, if you can cache that, you make your site run faster. We're not talking about caching the generated output of the page, we're caching the database queries. Now, the problem with an e-commerce store is that if you're searching for shoes and I'm searching for socks and he's searching for shirts, we might get each other's cash. And that would be bad because I really wasn't looking for shoes today. I like my shoes. But poorly written plugins can cause uh, cash pollution. 
where that issue starts happening. Now, out of the box, object caching and WooCommerce are perfectly compatible. They work great together. In fact, we uh, outside of DreamHost, I strongly recommend if you're using a, uh, an e-commerce store, please look into memcached and object caching to make your site run faster and safer. But it does have to be done carefully, and it's very likely that it's a third-party add-on to WooCommerce that's causing this issue. Uh, hopefully, GoDaddy would be responsive if you contacted them and says, I'm having a problem with object caching. Something's poisoning my cache. Can you help me find out? I really hope that they would. I, I trust that they would. And if DreamHost doesn't, tell me, and I'll go and find out who didn't and, and have a talk to them. <laughs> OK. And it's now 101. I haven't had lunch, and I'm starving. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you guys did learn something. And I will be around for the rest of the week.